Um, so welcome to our Speaking of Oats webinar this week. Um, my name is Charlene White. I work for the Ottawa Research and Development Centre of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and I'm also the editor of the Oat Newsletter. My co-host is Jim Bradeen, and he's professor and head of the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Minnesota, and he's also the director of Oat Global. Now, Oat Global is a public-private partnership that aims to coordinate and connect oat researchers and extension professionals worldwide with each other and also with people from all along the entire oat value chain. Now, this seminar was supposed to have been presented last week, but we did have some technical difficulties. So far, everything's fine. It was kind of ironic that it was Burns Day, uh, as it was Robert's, Robert Burns who wrote the famous poem that talks about, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. And, and I mean, yeah, the, they don't always work out so well. Um, it was also Australia Day last week, if you were on the other side of midnight, uh, that is. Today, February 1st, we seem to have a thing with holidays for this webinar. It's actually the Lunar New Year, so we just wanted to say a happy year of the tiger to everybody celebrating that today. And we also like to acknowledge that uh, it's the beginning of Black History Month today as well, at least in the Canada and the US. So even though we weren't able to connect with our main speaker, Pamela Zwer, last week, uh, we did actually have a good session and that was recorded. Um, this session is also being recorded, so take note of that. Also, another sort of little housekeeping thing, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box to ask your questions during the presentation and not the chat box. So they are two different things. So questions please in the Q&A box and chat can go in the chat box. Um, a little bit about our speakers now. So Pamela recently retired from being the breeder in charge of the National Oat Breeding Program at Sardi in South Australia, and she's now working as an oat breeding consultant. Uh, Brian Rossnagel is, is back today. He was here with us last week, and he's here again today. He's also retired, and he was the oat and barley breeder at the University of Saskatchewan here in Canada. So the title of today's presentation is the origin and evolution of the International Oat Conference. So Pamela and Brian, thank you very much for being here today. And I will pass things over to you. Thank you, Charlene. It's great to be here. And um, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything technologically will go well today. Um, it's been uh, a lot of fun, actually, to put together this presentation um, about the origin and evolution of the International Oak Conference. And pictured here is um, a photo of the first IOC, um, which was actually scheduled to be at the American Oat Workers Conference, but it was opened up to um, an international audience. And so this is the first photograph of the participants for the IOC. And it's interesting because there's several people within this photograph that uh, were and, and still are prominent uh, researchers um, in oats. So with that, um, this was um, in 1982. Um, and I'll uh, go on and talk a little bit more about um, how the IOC actually was created. So this, this was supposed to happen a week ago and it was Australia Day. So um, I'm going to say Happy Australia Day um, a week later. Um, and this uh, was the landing of the first fleet at Sydney Cove in 1788. Um, the Union flag was raised by Arthur Phillip and um, it, this particular day was known as the first landing day um, until the 26th of January in 1938. Um, for us, it's a day to embrace the Aboriginal culture and the cultures that have immigrated to the continent. And so as you can see here, we have um, the Aboriginal flag on the right and the Australian flag on the left. So today, um, just as a summary, um, we'll talk about how the IOC evolved. Um, Brian will talk about the early conferences. And um, I've had a few emails uh, from uh, 
Mike McMullen, uh, who talks a little bit about some of those early conferences. Um, I was actually not on the scene in the, um, the Oat area until 1995. So I'll talk about conferences thereafter. And uh, finally, I'd like to talk about what the IOC has meant to me in terms of my career and, and as well as Brian. So although the first conference was in 1982, um, the discussions about um, putting together um, an IOC started in, um, and was reported in the 1976 Oak Newsletter. And so they um, discussed the desirability and feasibility of establishing an Oak Conference of international scope. And they talked about um, a selected group of foreign scientists um, that would be invited to the American Oak Workers Conference. And Briegel and Fry were selected to advise the chairman, um, Murphy, who to invite. So then if we go on to the 1977 Oat Newsletter, um, Harold Marshall reported that there were 22 foreign scientists that were invited and two attended. Now, I'm not sure um, this would have been uh, an earlier American Oat Workers Conference, but that wasn't really documented. Um, but Bent Motson and David Thompson were the um, two um, foreigners that uh, actually attended. And then there were questionnaires that were put out, um, you know, trying to decide would there be a, a interest globally for um, an international Oat Conference? And as it turns out, um, it was very positive and people had discussed, you know, maybe meeting every four years would be a good thing. So that um, two years, you, two years you'd have the American Oat Workers Conference and then two years later, the IOC. And so that is sort of how all of that evolved. Ken Fry moved um, that a committee be appointed by the chair to determine um, a need for the IOC and, and that was passed. So in the 1978 Oak News letter, letter um, a subcommittee was uh, appointed and that was Ken Fry from Iowa, um, R. McKenzie from Winnipeg and B. Matson from Sweden. And then I, uh, you go on to look at the 1979 Oat Newsletter and um, they had a poll of 43 out of 55 that returned favorable uh, comments about an IOC every four to five years. And most favored combining the IOC with wheat or barley. Um, and then discussion centered on making the next American Oat Workers Conference an experimental IOC. So then we go on, and in 1980, um, a joint meeting of the American Oat Workers Conference and the first International Oat Research Workshop was announced for June 21st to the 23rd in 1982 at Pennsylvania State University, State College. And so the announcement was made early uh, so that non-USA researchers um, and Canadians had time to organize, to uh, fund their attendance. And going on, uh, it spelled out in the uh, 1980 newsletter of how, how it would proceed. So the language would be um, in English, uh, presentation would be about 20 minutes, um, and the plans to publish the abstracts of the papers would be in the Oat Newsletter of the American Oat Workers Conference. And information for this was provided by Harold Marshall, who was the secretary of the American Oat Workers Conference. So um, then it proceeded. So in 1982 at State College in Pennsylvania, um, Harold Marshall was the local organizing person, and that was actually the first um, IOC. 
And it was a success as demonstrated by the following IOCs, as you can see here, um, 1985 Avariswith, um, 1988 Lund, Sweden, 1992 Adelaide, Australia, 1996 Saskatoon, 2000 Christchurch, 2004 Helsinki, 2008 Minneapolis, and then 2012 Beijing and 2016. St. Petersburg. So as I said, I wasn't, I didn't attend the earlier um, uh, IOCs because uh, in 1981, I went to the University of California at Davis um, to start getting my PhD. Um, and here pictured is Hazel Shands, Don Schrickel, Louise Federici and myself, and we're in the Quaker Oats um, International Oat Nursery. And as part of my um, putting myself through my PhD, I did the Quaker Oats Barley Yellow Dwarf Virus Nursery. And this is in 1985. Um, this was an incredible experience for me because I had quite a bit of special time um, out in looking at the oats with Hazel Shands. And um, I really kind of consider him as maybe the father of oat breeding for um, the USA. He just knew so much about all of the material um, in, in these nurseries. So um, Louise and I finished our PhD um, in 1986. Louise went back to Brazil to start his own oat breeding program. And um, I actually came over to Australia to um, conduct the um, Stemrus nursery, uh, well, the, the Stemrus survey um, in Australia for wheat and barley. And um, it wasn't until 1995 when um, I applied for the oak breeding program um, at Sardi that I came to Australia um, to lead the program. At that time, it was not a national program, um, but it went on to become a national program um, later on. So as I said, I, I didn't, um, I don't have really any information about Aberystwyth or Lund, but, um, and I didn't attend um, the Oak Conference in Adelaide, but um, Sue Hoppo, who um, is still with Sardi, provided these photos um, of the conference and uh, a few notes. Um, the photo up to the left shows um, the Fourth International Oak Conference welcome delegates to Adelaide. And in that photo, um, to the far left is Jeff Palmer, who was the head of the quality uh, program here in Adelaide. Um, and then Andy Barr is the third person. And, and the next to Andy on his right um, is Alan Dubay. And uh, so um, as Sue, I've got a few notes here, said that um, there were two days of talks on the Monday and Tuesday. And then um, what she can remember as far as the field days, which are always important to our IOCs. They um, went to a uh, field day at Andy's farm and then went on and had a barbecue lunch at the Turf Field Research Center, visited a, a grower's farm, and then went on to a winery in the Brasa. So um, it was quite a successful uh, conference. Um, according to the notes, there were a hundred full-time participants, um, 35 part-time, and um, a few students and uh, accompanying persons. And so um, it was truly an international conference. There were 22 countries that were represented um, in that. And one of the things, um, if you look at the um, uh, photo of Andy on the right, that is actually an inflatable bat. And what had happened with the conference was that it was um, supposedly held at the Hilton, but they were doing renovations. 
And so there was hammering and all sorts of noise that was interrupting the conference. And so they actually had to change the venue to the Grovesner. And um, that was just a, a souvenir bat for Andy <laughs> as um, something uh, that you probably don't want to happen when you're trying to uh, have a conference. And so um, Mike McMullen um, has sent me a few notes about um, some of the early conferences. And one of his comments, which I think is really important, is that um, the Quaker Oats Company was really instrumental in making sure that this IOC continued. And the players at the time that were really important were Don Schrickel, Sam Weaver, and Bruce Roskins. Um, and so they really ensured that um, from the very early start that, that these conferences would continue. And Mike made a comment that um, as a young person in these early conferences, that um, it was a thrill for him to meet people who were heavyweights in terms of research. And so uh, in terms of the Aberystwyth conference meeting, Hugh Thomas, Mike Leggett, and John Valentine. So, and I think, you know, as um, participants in the IOC over the years that this has really been a very important part as far as I'm concerned about the meeting with, with people um, who have been long-term scientists in the oat world and young people as well. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Okay, Pam, uh, and you'll move the slides along and you can move yes, from I will. that one. Uh -huh. you, you can move from that one. <laughs> oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> the next one. Um, so uh, um, as Pam uh, was saying, uh, the, the history of, of the organization is, is quite interesting. Um, a lot of it came from the fact uh, that, as I mentioned last week, for those of you who have heard this before from me, um, a number of the individuals who kind of got the whole thing going were people uh, who, like myself, uh, me later on, of course, but worked on more than one crop kind, oats and wheat or oats and barley and so on. So there was, and you'll notice that even Pan noted the uh, one uh, part of the minutes there one time where they, uh, where there was, you know, um, an interest in hosting uh, the the new oat conference along with barley or wheat. Uh, not sure exactly why that didn't happen. Uh, based on my own experience, uh, likely because the barley and wheat group said no, uh, <laughs> because they didn't consider oats a real crop at that time, probably, um, or were beginning not to because prior to that time, oats had been a real crop and something like barley really hadn't been. <laughs> but that all changed in the 50s and 60s around the world. And, uh, and at that time, oats were, were kind of struggling I mean, oat acreage in Canada and the U.S. and everywhere was dropping at that at that time. So uh, one of the reasons I remember Ken Fry saying to me one, at one point one time, one of the reasons that they, a group of them wanted to push forward with it was to garner more interest, support, uh, make it more visible, particularly to groups like uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Canada, the USDA, and, and to make sure that oats didn't fall off the wagon. Totally. Uh, personally, I, I uh, was not able to attend the conference in, in Wales, but I, I was able to attend the one in Sweden. Um, and uh, that was, a, you know, getting to be 10 years into my career as an oat researcher, as well as a barley researcher. Uh, but um, a few of us, um, and particularly I do remember um, ending up in the back of a tour bus during the Sweden meeting with Andy Barr. And that was the first time Andy and I had actually met each other. And uh, we established a long time relationship, both in our oat programs and then later in our barley programs when, when Andy switched over to barley. Uh, and that, that uh, connection and friendship exists to this day. In fact, I just exchanged an email about whether Andy had got some rain this week on his farm now that he's out of research and into farming. Uh, and uh, those are the kind of things that, as Mike pointed out, are so important. And, and I don't remember for myself uh, whether, um, it was uh, an IOC meeting or an AOWC meeting. I think it might have been an AOWC one for me, spending a few hours in the field with Hazel Shams. And as you said, Pam, um, Hazel was just one of those guys. 
never said too much during the meetings and so on and so forth. Didn't say too much when you were on the bus and what have you. But if you were off by yourself with him in the field, he made very, very astute observations to pass along to us young pups. Um, I'll always distinctly remember one thing as a breeder, he told me, he said that uh, I had released a variety at that point, or was about to release a variety, and, and it was, uh, was kind of notorious in the, in the testing program in Western Canada for having a lot of blast. And I was being given a bit of grief by some of the older oat researchers in Canada about that. And Hazel said, he, he called me over and he said, don't worry about that blast in your variety, Brian. He said, that's actually a really good thing. What it's indicative of is when you get it under stress, it, it doesn't fill those kernels. But if you get a good year, it'll fill them up and beat the hell out of the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> and those were the kinds of things. That, and uh, I'll also remember uh, at some of those meetings, there, there were some other um, sort of non-oat researchers, but key researchers, at least in North America, that attended those meetings, people like John Grafius, who talked about yield component compensation. And as a young breeder, made you really think about the fact that, yeah, if you got really carried away about making big kernels, you probably weren't going to have as many of them. <laughs> and, and that these things all work together and so on. It's so very, very important. Uh, one of the other things Andy and I talked about uh, uh, before he hosted the meeting was that we needed to get these things to be not too formal. And, and that, you know, the, the, the science was important and so on, but there was also a great need just for that community get together and, and uh, uh, you know, maybe having a few beers or whatever and so on. And the first oat meetings that I attended were relatively dour uh, compared to the barley <laughs> meetings I was attending. And, and I think Andy's, Andy's conference was the first one uh, really that, that Andy, you know, made the effort to, uh, to, to get us to a winery and things like that. And so people could mix and mingle and talk and, and meet each other and, and discuss things and in the field as well, so that you could see material growing. And the slide that's up there right now, one of the things that uh, this Brian Harvey on the left, who was the malting barley breeder, myself and our department head at the time, Malcolm Devine, and um, didn't have a slide of it, but the very next thing, or you'll, you'll see that none of us are wearing ties there. And that was because just prior to that, uh, Brian and I uh, both had opened the conference wearing ties and we proceeded to cut each other's tie off with a pair of scissors. Uh, there was some <laughs> gas, from the, gas from some of the old timers in the audience and so on, but our point was that people were there to learn and to have some fun. And uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and we put a lot of emphasis on, on that getting together and getting out into the field. Brian and I both being breeders, uh, you know, so we're, we're uh, somewhat geneticists and somewhat quality people and somewhat plant physiologists and somewhat all those kinds of good things, pathologists and what have you, but we were breeders and we, we wanted to get people into the field. And, and that was uh, really important. Uh, we've done that in Sweden. I think it was done in Aberystwyth as well, but we put a lot more emphasis on it. And you can see because we, we combined the barley and oat conferences. Uh, part of the reason that happened, by the way, was that the oat conference was running every four years. The Barley Conference was running every five years at that time. So that meant that, you know, 1996 happened to be a year when they both fell at the same time. And we, uh, and with a lot of effort, particularly by Brian, uh, the Oak community was quite keen to support me in going ahead and, and hosting the Oak Conference in conjunction with Barley. Barley community internationally wasn't quite so keen on that. Um, and uh, so Brian, with a great deal of effort, uh, got that to happen. And, and we did that, and, and there was some talk after that meeting about continuing to work together, but it, it didn't happen that way. But by then, I think, and as Mike pointed out, largely because of the support of Quaker, the real key support from them to keep these things going, and the fact that Oats was beginning to climb back onto the bandwagon uh, as a crop around the world, uh, we were able to keep the international conference going. Next one, Pam. Sure. And, and there we are in the field, uh, actually looking at some, at some oats. Uh, we were lucky that year. We had a pretty good season and we had an excellent set of trials to show people and so on. As I mentioned last week, for those who were there uh, and somebody complained last week about the dust while on the tour, well, that's part of being in the prairies in Western Canada in the summertime. But those plots got a whole lot better after that and unfortunately actually got snowed on before we got them harvested. We did get them harvested, but we had to, take, we had to wait for the snow to melt off uh, one day in October. Uh, and <laughs> next one, Pam. Um, one thing you'll see there, I'm standing on the, on the trailer talking to people about something, I'm sure, I don't know what, 
could have been just the information about where the bathrooms were probably. But you'll notice that I'm wearing a, a hat that a number of other people in the other pictures in here have on it. That's the kind of thing. Quaker bought a hat for every one of us. And that was not an easy thing to get organized. Uh, you know, we had to make sure we had all the colors exactly right for the Quaker folks in, in, in Chicago. Uh, I remember the first set of materials we had, uh, uh, not the hats per se, but others, uh, we, uh, we, we, we missed the particular blue color. And I can't remember the number of it now, it was about a seven digit number that described Quaker's blue color. And we had to change our initial advertising and marketing stuff to make sure that color was right. Uh, but guys like Sam and and Don and so on and Bruce were, were you know, really, really supportive and helpful and, and have really been a great way of keeping this whole thing going. Next one, Pam. I think there's a couple more. Uh, so again, we did the, uh, uh, what I'll call more the barley thing. And we had some really great social gatherings. The second night of the conference uh, we attended, uh, we, we had uh, folks and, and, and uh, Sapporo was a big supporter of our barley research program at that time. And they provided beer for everybody for the whole night. Uh, and we, uh, we visited a museum, uh, agricultural museum. And as usual, even though people had frowned about that when they were asked if they wanted to go to that uh, in their registration forms and everything, we couldn't get people out of the damn place, get them back to the hotels in time to get them uh, so they could get up the next morning for the rest of the conference. And then the final banquet was held in one of our downtown hotels. Next one, Pam. And then we wrapped up uh, with a, an outdoor event uh, at, uh, on the campus at the University of Saskatchewan in our research park. And again, it was that sort of getting people together and meeting each other and exchanging ideas and exchanging ideas, not only about oat genetics and so on, but about oat germplasm, about technical things. I know one of the things I mentioned last week that I always found useful about these conferences, both oats and barley that I attended around the world, was seeing someone else's idea of some little gizmo in the field or in the quality lab or whatever it might be that I went, oh man, that would sure make life a whole lot easier in our program took the idea back or sometimes even took the piece of equipment back and or got it later. And uh, it, it helped a great deal in, in moving forward with our program. I think we're back to you now, Pam. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Yes, excellent. Thanks, Brian, that was really good. Um, okay, so the next conference was in Christchurch, New Zealand. And um, I, uh, sent an email to Keith Armstrong just to see if he might have some photos, but unfortunately um, he said no, that um, there were no photos. So um, just a, a few dot points here about, about the conference. Um, the theme was why oats? And so that was what uh, was put out for the speakers to say, why grow oats and why oats? Ken Fry was the conference keynote speaker. And I can remember that Ken went on and talked about uh, several things, but the one that stands out to me was that he said that his mother fixed porridge every single morning and he couldn't stand porridge. <laughs> I thought, here's this great oak reader who <laughs> is finally admitting that uh, he doesn't like porridge. So that, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, some of the things that stood out to me was that um, that uh, one of the dinners, um, every entree uh, had oats as part of the ingredients. Um, and it was a well-known um, New Zealand chef that did that. And they had organized to get two boxes of ice cream, oat ice cream um, from Sweden into New Zealand. And it almost didn't happen because the quarantine wouldn't allow the ice cream into the country because um, they thought it was milk. So with some fast talking and so on, they finally convinced them that it was oats and not milk and they allowed it to come in. And so we did have oat ice cream at um, one of the dinners. But we didn't and get it at the one we were supposed to have it at. <laughs> it was supposed to be at the, fa at the fancy dinner, the the, uh, the main one, and it didn't show up until the the, uh, the final little get together we had. <laughs> yeah, I didn't remember that. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> and um, 
the main conference dinner was held um, at the Christchurch gondola. And this is um, a picture that I've gotten that showed the, the scenery um, on the way up to the restaurant. It was really uh, quite dramatic. The next conference was held in Helsinki in 2004. And again, as, as Brian has said, um, you know, it's these conferences are so important in terms of, of uh, new research um, and all of the, the great talks that happen. But really, you know, the, one of the, the main things that just stands out is getting out into the countryside of the hosting country. And um, these are photos of the day that we went out um, on the field day. And it's just so fantastic to be able to see um, things like this. And here's a few colleagues that um, I just had, had to put in. Um, the top photo is of Peter McCormick and Sue Hoppo with a couple of our hay varieties, uh, Winteru and Rusher. And then the bottom uh, photo is of Sue and myself um, with our um, milling varieties, um, Matika, um, Possum, and uh, Quoll. Matika actually went on to be, and still is, one of the main um, milling varieties in Australia. And here um, we've got a, a few people again, uh, Brian, Peter, and Anders, who are uh, studiously looking at, I think maybe the grain quality or something like that. But again, that was so important, these, these um, field excursions. And here's um, the, the big dinner. Um, there were two boats. Um, I think it's the Gulf of Finland that we went out. I can't quite recall, but um, it was, again, uh, a time to mingle and um, chat with friends and um, have, a, have a beer. And in this case, it was oat beer. So that was quite good. In fact, um, for the Perth um, conference, uh, Peter is organizing for one of the lo local breweries to brew 100% oat beer. And he's already done it once and it was quite good. So um, the eighth international oat conference was in Minneapolis. And um, just a, a few photos of the um, welcome function. I can't recall where that was. I don't know if you recall, Brian, but um, maybe Jim can... Uh... It looks like the, the Mill City ruins. No, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, these sorts of functions are, are great to sort of kick off the conferences. Um, here's a, um, one of the... Um, charters, the cruise on the Mississippi River. Uh, a photo down in the lower part is uh, Louise and his wife, Maria, um, Stephen Harrison, and a, a few others. Um, again, really important. Some more photos. And then, of course, the, the field day at the University of Minnesota campus. Um, looking at, again, and one of the things that I find is really interesting is to see varieties that I've developed in Australia and how well they are adapted um, in other countries. And or not. So, or <laughs> not, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, surprisingly, I was amazed at how well um, our milling varieties um, and hay varieties did in Finland and in, in Minnesota. So um, but it's always fun to have a walk around. And again, this is a way to look at a potential germplasm to be introduced into your breeding program. And in my breeding program at Sardi, this was critical. This is the Quaker Oats International Oat Nursery. Um, and these conferences was uh, instrumental in uh, introducing material for better disease resistance and performance. And um, just a, a couple of photos of um, important people within oat research, um, Dion and, and Howard, 
um, and how much that they have contributed um, to where we are now. Another aspect of these conferences is actually uh, having an opportunity to um, uh, go and see industries um, globally. And so, you know, going to um, mills to see, you know, how, um, what they're doing. And also, um, again, on the, the lower uh, photograph, uh, going and, and meeting with growers uh, and discussing, uh, you know, what's important to you and, and bringing that back home. So the ninth International Oak Conference was in Beijing. And um, that was, uh, yes, quite interesting. And again, not only is it the scientific papers and research that's so important, but at this particular conference, I think this is one of the things that stood out. And this was um, a demonstration of uh, preparation of oat um, products, uh, traditional oat products in China. And it was absolutely amazing what these women could do with this, um, everything, all of the dough was oats. And you can see up in the upper right, um, one of the products. And then we had an opportunity to actually go and mingle um, with these women and, and have a go at it. It, it was a lot harder than what they made it look, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and again, the linkages and meeting up with <clears throat> friends and colleagues. Um, um, the lower two photographs, uh, there's um, a photo of Stephen Harrison, Vern Burroughs, and, and Wren. Um, Wren is quite an um, important um, person in um, China for the oat research program um, in the country. And then of course, an, another uh, photo and um, that happens to be Charlene's daughter there to the left and then Vern and Vern's wife, Betty, and then Wren. Wren had actually studied with Vern in Ottawa. Um, so there's quite a close relationship there. Again, getting out to the field to have a look at um, oats. And then the cultural aspect of getting out to see the history of the hosting country. Um, it was absolutely incredible to get to the Great Wall and actually um, walk on it. You can see that there's quite a few people there, but um, it was really an incredible experience. And another aspect of the conferences is um, having um, the hosting country um, display their um, products. And so in the lower uh, photo, you can see um, this is a booth for Sea Mild, um, which is one, one of the major um, companies producing oat products in China. And so I, I've kind of, um, past all of this, but um, in Finland, somehow I was roped in to become secretary for the IOC. I think that was Brian. <laughs> and um, so I was secretary for the um, IOC in Finland and also in Minnesota. And then at the conference in China, I was nominated and elected to become the IOC chair. And so in China, I was the chair and also I continued on um, to be the chair in, in Russia. And um, here you can see Igor is um, opening up the conference. Uh, and one of the things that I've, I found incredible was just the history of, of the, um, Research Center and what Vavilov has meant to um, oats um, and other crops through the world. And I, I thought, you know, 
this is a, a fantastic slide. It's better to display excessive concern now than to destroy all that has been created by nature for thousands and millions of years. And that was just an incredible experience to go and see um, plant samples that had been collected by Vavilov and what he has really meant in terms of um, germ, germplasm preservation. We had a lovely um, conference dinner um, it, pictured here. Again, um, friends together. Um, and so, yeah. And uh, entertainment um, at the conference was fantastic. We had these ladies that were um, dancing around and there's Nick up in the upper um, photo. And uh, down in the lower photo, there's Louise and Jennifer um, laughing at, at, I'm not quite sure what she's doing. It looks like she's having a bit of a drink there in between dancing. And again, uh, you know, so much, um, so many historic um, things um, in Russia that we were able to see. And again, uh, the field plots um, going out to have a look at material. And again, the history of St. Petersburg. And um, I passed the baton in terms of chair um, to both Nick and um, Catherine um, as co-chairs, uh, and then uh, Rob Lockman and Georgie Troop from uh, Western Australia um, got up to promote um, having the next conference in Perth. And um, we were lucky to be able to, um, to win that. Um, Unfortunately, COVID has sort of <laughs> caused issues, but um, we're looking forward to hosting um, the 2022 um, International Oak Conference in Perth. Uh, we're um, meeting uh, monthly and things are progressing very nicely in terms of, of the conference. So I just wanted to conclude with, you know, it's all of the things that Brian had talked about and, and what I've talked about, but what it, the IHOC has meant to me in terms of, of my career. And the update of the knowledge of oat research globally has been so important because the oat community is very small compared to other crops. And particularly um, leading the national oat breeding program in Australia. And um, eventually there were no other oak breeders. So I really depended on um, going globally to see what others were doing. And yeah, um, the, um, finding out the importance of oak to the hosting country, um, networking with colleagues and friends in the oak community. It's a great place to develop joint research projects. And um, you know, that's uh, very important, especially um, if you're a bit isolated and, and you don't have others that are close by. Um, again, to observe the global oak germplasm um, in the host country field trials and sourcing that once, once you get home to use in your crossing program. Organize visit with the host country's growers and industry and finally learn about the host country's culture and historical significance. Those have all, all been really, really important to me. So is there a take home message? Maybe there's more questions than answers. I think um, through the years, most of the themes have been reflected on the health benefit of oak for human consumption. And finally, I think that message has gotten through to consumers. And so I think the prominence of oats um, in terms of um, health is, is now recognized. One of the things that we've struggled with is the gross margins for oat and growers rotations. Oats need to compete with other crops. 
are we there yet? I don't think we are yet, but hopefully with genomics and the new phenomics, we'll get there. How does, oh, be more competitive in the rotations? So I asked the question, and this is a lot what growers, when I would go out to field days and talk about, we're releasing this new variety, it's great, and it has higher beta glucan. And the growers say, well, what's in it for me? And there probably isn't anything in it for them, other than if they have porridge in the morning, they'll be healthier. Um, should growers be paid more for varieties that have better health benefits, higher beta glucan? And if oat is healthy for humans, what about feed and fodder for animals? So with that, I conclude and I just want to thank Charlene for sharing photos and guidance for the talk, um, Jim for organizing the meeting and, and for everyone um, and for Brian sharing a step back into time and for all of you who have come back and participated um, after last week's uh, technical difficulties. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pamela, and, uh, and you're welcome, although really, I mean, you're the one who put all the work into all of that, so, that's, so that's really great. So, actually, Jim's looking after the Q&A. Do we have any Q&A? Uh, there, there are no questions yet. Um, Steve Harrison did offer a, um, his gratitude, indicating that this is very um, interesting. Uh, Liliana, thank you very much. <laughs> Charlene, I, I, would, I would just uh, add a little bit in that uh, I think uh, a couple of key things about the conference itself and it's keeping it going and so on is that this, this is very different than our colleagues in, in the barley community or the wheat community and soybeans and corn and so on, uh, uh, in that this very much relies on the people who are organizing the next conference and then um, getting cajoled into hosting the next one and so on. And traditionally, what we, what we did was whoever was uh, cajoled into hosting the next conference obviously was the conference chair for that uh, particular upcoming meeting. And then that person, uh, part of the role was that that individual was to take over as the chair of the committee, the International Oak Committee. And, and there are a lot of details with that. And there are budgetary issues, which were always a concern. <clears throat> and I know I can speak for myself. Uh, I know uh, when Andy hosted his conference, the conference in, in Adelaide, uh, he was pretty much on his own. He had he had some support from the uh, from Sardi and so on, but it was it was pretty minimal. Uh, and then we were able to generate uh, in Saskatoon because we had that large group with the barley community and so on. We were able to generate a lot more sponsorship, and uh, because we had a larger number of people, you know, there are certain things that cost so many dollars, and every person that registers after that's paid for. That's kind of money in the pot. Uh, and we did have some funds left over and we continually moved those around. It was always difficult because there was nothing official about the IOC. It was just, you know, yeah. me to you and you to me and so on. And, uh, uh, but, it, but it has worked really, really well. And, and I think we also managed over time to move from being more, um, back when the Oak Conference first started, the IOC first started, the, the, the sort of sister conferences for barley and wheat we're all basically largely about genetics. And, and so, uh, so that's some plant breeding and some pathology and so on, but almost nothing about quality, industrial uses, and certainly nothing about farmers and agronomy and so on. And I think we gradually, as Pam has already alluded to, we gradually have included those things. And in particular, we've been able to uh, make this a conference about the whole industry, uh, particularly from the plant breeding sort of uh, science-y end of things, pathology and so on, right through to the end users. Still probably not so much about the growers as we'd maybe like it. And that's because, you know, growers want to know about stuff for growers and, and they're busy at the times we host these conferences because we host them when the crop is in the field and so on. Uh, so it's, and, and, and they don't have, we don't have uh, 
a lot of grower organizations, although we do now in Canada have some pretty strong ones and, and a few other places in the UK and so on. And so we can more directly involve those other aspects of the whole oat community. And I think that's uh, leading to the strength along with the improvement in the status of oat as a, as a food product and as a feed product uh, all around the world. And, and that's helping stabilize the whole operation. But I think one of the key things is we've never allowed it to become too bureaucratic. And I know that has been a bit problematic in some of the other organizations. The Wheat Group, for example, they're so large and it's such a big operation to host the conference that you really can't expect somebody to take the time off for two years or so from their research program and their teaching work or whatever it might be to be the organizer. So they have to hire professional organizing groups. And then you get into you know, big costs and all those kind of things. And I think that the oat community has done a really good job the sponsorship from industry uh, has been really, really good and really, really important uh, and, and from governments, uh, you know, uh, research supporters and so on. Uh, but keeping it, keeping it somewhat um, homey, if you will, I think has really, has really helped keep it going. And, and I, I hope that as we move along in the future, um, that sort of attitude of, you know, uh, person A passing, it, passing the baton to person B, to person C, to person, persons D and so on. Uh, will be uh, will be continued and, and, and really is, is critical. And as Pam pointed out, the interaction with other researchers, particularly for plant breeders, I think, but also for everybody else. I know our pathology, the old pathology group around the world is very interconnected and strong, uh, and as is the quality uh, end of things. Uh, maybe a bit less on the agronomy side, again, because Agronomists, like everybody else in the research community, have to go where the funds are. And there really aren't a lot of funds directed at oats for agronomy. There's far more at corn and soy and, and wheat and so on and so forth. So, um, but, you know, I think, you know, most of us try to include that aspect of oat production in the, in the conferences. And over time, I, I think that will probably uh, come to pass as being as a, equally an important part of the activity. Yeah, we do need more agronomists and people for sure. Yeah, that has been one of the more neglected areas. Uh, there was one conference, actually, I'm not sure whether it was <coughs> IOC or AWC. I think it was IOC in Minneapolis. There was actually an organic farmer who presented. I do recall that. So the, the odd time, yeah, we have had producers. Um, I think there was another, actually in Seattle, there was somebody as well. So occasionally, there are producers involved as well. But yeah, certainly it would be great to have that entire value chain sort of end to end. And some of the other things that I think you know, are, are important to point out is that you know when these things started, there were no posters. <laughs> I, remember, I remember taking my very first poster to the Lund meeting in a suitcase, <laughs> all nicely, you know, uh, pieces of paper stuck onto pieces of cardboard, which were then stuck up on the wall. And some, uh, some of the uh, posters were handwritten <laughs> and so on. And, and I mean, that, that has really also expanded the ability of all of those kinds of conferences to accommodate far more presenters and particularly yeah. accommodate graduate student presentations and those kinds of things become a very important uh, part of those conferences. Uh, other little details that are kind of interesting and funny is that uh, I remember, I, I'm not sure where we had the discussion, and it may have been at an uh, American Oat Workers Conference uh, meeting where there were issues about whether it was called a conference or a symposium or a workshop and so on. And that was all tied to people who work for various federal government agencies around the world and whether or not they could get funding to travel to something called a conference versus something called a workshop and so on and so forth. So, so those kind of things, uh, 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 you know, we talked last time a little bit about how the, the International Oak Committee and conference and, and so on are now kind of, you're, you're kind of handling those in a bit of a different way, Pam, in terms of, uh, uh, of nomenclature, if you will. <laughs> and yeah. It, yeah. It, those, just, those are just kind of some of the fun kinds of things that you run into uh, over time. Yeah, just sort of going back to the grower aspect, um, that's something that I'd like to highlight um, in terms of the, the Perth conference is that there is a lot of grower um, participation in the grains industry, uh, Western Australia, um, is organizing the conference. And so um, 
we have a we'll have a lot of input, and I, I believe that there will actually be growers that are going to be attending the conference. So um, I think that you know we're sort of moving into that direction. Well, I was just noticing again uh, last time uh, Ash Wees joined uh, the discussion. And he's back. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Ash, do you want to join the panel again and maybe put in a few words for growers and what you'd like to see more about the, the conference? I don't know, can we? Ah, there, we've allowed you to speak should you so desire. Uh, Hi, Ash. There we go. Because, yeah, we're talking about the whole value chain is that like you're here, you're part of this conference. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Can you see, see me, shall I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. No, the panel has wrapped it up well. Like um, the, the grains industry of Western Australia that's hosting the conference is is really diverse. It's made up of the whole supply chain. So we, we're trying to involve everybody in that supply chain. And um, and also just to make sure that we get numbers to the conference, we, we will have part of the program around agronomy and, and growers. And, and and I think it's, you know, I've really appreciated Brian's comments about it's great for, for the breeding um, and the research community to meet with the end users and the growers and, and that whole supply chain to um, to be able to engage and, and you, know, in, you know, interact and stuff like that. So that'll definitely be happening in Perth. So um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, that will be really great for sure. Um, I'm wondering, are there some other things that should be shared about the upcoming conference? Pamela, if you stop sharing your screen, we, I might be able to bring up the website for people. Okay, um, let's see if I can. <laughs> can <you laughs> my best laid plans, yes. <laughs> um, actually work too. Let's see. Uh, hmm. It's actually best laid schemes in the original. Charlene, you should be able to just share and, and bump, bump her slide out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shall we try that? Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I hit the wrong button myself. Yes. Do I want to continue? Yes. Bye, Pamela. <laughs> just your slides. Just your slides. Okay. So this, oh. I haven't gone on to the page. This is the section on hey. that's self-serving, isn't it? This is the IOC <laughs> page in the Oat newsletter. I did describe last time when we were, you know, making up for lack of presentation um, that this was here. So, and there is a link directly from here. This is my favorite way to get to the uh, page. Oh, there we go. Okay, right. So, this is the page. So just internationaloat.com for everybody. Um, the call for abstracts is open. Uh, oh, on Twitter, hashtag oat2022. Um, yeah, and I did notice you guys are doing something a little bit different. There are two types of submissions for abstracts for industry and science. So yes. that, that's a little bit different. Do you want to maybe talk about that a little bit? Well, I think that's, you know, part of what we're trying to do is to engage um, agronomists and um, not, not only researchers, but, you know, agronomists, consultants, and, and those sorts of people. And their focus is probably a bit different than um, what a researcher might be. So that's why we thought we'd have two different formats to try to um, accommodate um, the differences. Okay, that makes sense. Um, also, to register, there's the buy tickets button up here. So these are the different packages and so on and so forth. And I, I think it's explained pretty well there um, what you need to do for that. But what I'm looking for, I suppose, really is the program. There's the program. So, yeah, field tour, of course, we have to have the field tours. Actually, Brian, the first conference I ever got to go to, first IOC one, 
uh, was the one in Saskatoon, and that was because uh, I was a technician, but I was part of the um, Quaker Oats Consortium as mm -hmm. it was called, doing molecular mapping at the time. And there were, there were Quaker meetings for that associated with the conference. And I wore that hat for years, <laughs> <laughs> until it wore out. In fact, I still have some of you sometimes, if you've seen me in other meetings that are a little bit less formal, I have a wall full of patches and things behind me uh, sewn onto a blanket. And one of them is actually part of the band off that hat <laughs> as <laughs> sitting here. Um, that's my little story that I'll, I'll stick in there. Um, <laughs> right, so so the 10th of October through the 13th, and there's some of the things there. Um, yeah, there were also originally to be workshops elsewhere, correct? Has anything been done? Do we know what's going to happen with some of those workshops? Yes, eventually? yes, we do. Um, the workshops will all be held um, in Perth. Um, and I believe that there's three that um, are being um, developed. Um, one is on um, oat quality and products. Another is on um, breeding genomics and phenomics. And um, the third is to do with rust research. And um, yeah. Are they concurrent? <laughs> I think they are on the same day, yes. Oh, darn, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we can, uh, it's probably not set in stone if, um, if we get feedback that, um, there are people that want to attend more than one. We might be able to um, go back to the drawing board and accommodate that. Well, there are a lot of people who do the sort of genomics end of things who are also working on rust resistance genes, for example. So that's why. Yes, that's right. I'm yeah. About that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So these are the other topics here. Um, we are actually at sort of at the end of our time. I'm just kind of going on a little bit uh, more just to give a little bit of- yeah. Just, just another comment that might yeah. be a bit different than other um, conferences is that we have keynote speakers for each of the sessions. Ah, yes. uh, so if you roll back up, yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, that's going to be uh, quite interesting to have um, keynote speakers uh, lead off um, for the sessions. And it's quite a diverse group. Right, yeah. There's the rest of the bunch there. Mm. So, excellent. Actually, I see Catherine there. Catherine's actually, well, I'm not sure about right now, but was on the call. <laughs> She's also one of the co-chairs. Uh, for the meeting as well. And Nick was able to join us last week and he um, spoke a little bit. Um, I don't know if Catherine, if you have anything you would like to add. Oh, Al I see Alan actually made a comment here. Field tour will be at York, one of Western Australia's oldest towns settled late 1890s. And there's a link there. So everyone who's on the call can actually um, go to that link to see uh, what that's all about. So that's great. Um, okay, uh, I think since we are actually out of time, perhaps I'm gonna stop sharing this for now. Um, I do have a slide for our next webinar. Should I put that up, Jim? Is there anything else that anyone would like to add? A big thank you to our panelists today. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, all of you know pamela brian ash again for joining us uh, yeah it was really great and a lot of fun so um yes indeed thank you very much for for participating and sharing uh, it was wonderful i'm too focused on making my screen sharing work there we go all right so our next webinar this will also be at a bit of an unusual time because it's Alan Raddy. Uh, he's with Intergreen Australia, the new oat breeder there. So that will be, again, it will be a Tuesday, February 22nd at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. So that's my time. For the rest of you, um, EST is UTC minus five. So if you go to World Time Buddy, um, that's a pretty great site, can help you figure out um, just when that, that time is for you.
So. All right. So welcome everyone um, to our Speaking of Oats webinar for this month. Uh, very glad to see everybody joining us. Uh, as I did say, we are having a few technical difficulties. Uh, we've lost Pamela Zwer for a moment, who's our main speaker. Um, however, we'll uh, we'll move ahead with the introductions. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Charlene White, and I work with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Ottawa Research and Development Centre. And I'm also the editor of the Out Newsletter, which is why I'm here today. My co-host is Jim Bradeen, and he's head of the plant pathology department at the University of Minnesota, and he's also the director of Oak Global. So Oak Global and the newsletter co-sponsor these webinars, and Oak Global is a public-private partnership that aims to coordinate and connect oat researchers and oat extension professionals worldwide with each other and with individuals from along the entire oat value chain. So everyone, everybody is welcome to these seminars. Um, and we're very glad you're here today. Uh, I will introduce the speakers in a moment, but first we do have a couple of housekeeping issues. So because this is in webinar format, we have two sort of chat boxes. So one is the traditional chat box. The other one is Q&A, and that's for the questions and answers. So if you do have a question, please put it into the Q&A box and not the chat box, because that way we actually get a record of the questions that were asked, you know, in case we need to do any following up afterwards. Also, uh, and you'll have already noticed this, uh, today's session is being recorded. And so uh, once we're done, and hopefully we'll get through the whole thing, um, the video will be available on YouTube. So the main speaker today is Pamela Zwer, and Pamela recently retired from being the breeder in charge of the National Oat Breeding Program in Australia, and she was at Sardi in South Australia. And she's now working as an oat breeding consultant, so she still has her foot in the door. Um, with her today is Brian Rossnagel, and Brian retired a number of years ago, and he was the oat and barley breeder at the University of Saskatchewan here in Canada. Um, several other people also contributed to the talk, and we're kind of hoping that maybe some of you have some stories that you'd like to share with us as well. The title of today's presentation is The Origin and Evolution of the International Oat Conference, and I'd like to thank Pamela and Brian very much for being here today. And once we can connect with Pamela, we would love to have her tell us all about the International Oat Conference. Um, I see, how are we doing, Jim? Do we have any? I have just sent her the information that she needs to connect. So I hope she'll be with us very shortly. Okay, so now I was sort of gonna do this at the end, but do you want me to go ahead? There were a couple of things I was gonna show people in the newsletter about the IOC. So maybe we should start with that. I think that's great. Okay, so I'm just going to call that up first, make sure I'm on the right page. <laughs> that could be, okay, right. I'll share my screen. Okay, so this, you sh what you should be seeing is the homepage for the Oat Newsletter. Um, the address is just oatnews.org. So very simple to remember. And after I mention these things, uh, I will put the uh, information in the chat, um, you know, a few links so that people can uh, refer to the, the things I'm gonna talk about later on. So from the homepage now, the Oat, news, the Oat Newsletter has been around for a very long time. So this started way back in the, you know, the end of the 1950s. And a lot, some of the information that actually Pamela is going to be presenting today, uh, some of that history is in these old issues of the Oat Newsletter. And if you ever want to check out some of those, if you go across the top bar here to where it says research, on the drop down menu, there's something that says Oat Newsletter Archives. And if you click that, you will get links to all, whoops, all of the old copies of the newsletter. And so these go back, so yes, 1950 was the first one, that's right. 
And so these are all PDF files. And actually these were all scanned by uh, PepsiCo. It was uh, Gabe Guzmini actually who spearheaded this effort. So we, you know, we're very grateful that they were uh, able to do this for us. So if I pick one at random, let's say this one, this will go to uh, a PDF. And you can go through and you can search the PDFs and find out you know, all kinds of information. So that's one way that you can gain a little insight into how this community has developed over the years. Um, the other thing I was going to show you, uh, Pamela has quite a few images to show you. And under community news, we do actually have an image gallery. So if we scroll down to that, there are the different galleries. And if you click on any one of these images, it will bring up a series of photos from the different conferences. If you want more information about the conferences themselves, under the meetings tab, there is a page for the International Oak Conferences. And of course, the next one will be coming up, hopefully <laughs> in person this fall in Perth in Western Australia. Um, and the information for that, of course, is at the top because it's most relevant to what, uh, you know, is coming up. And if you scroll down from that, there's more information about the committees and, and that sort of thing as well. But then right at the end is a list of all the previous uh, conferences. And there are also links there. Um, a lot of these, of course, with the most recent conferences, we're linking to websites and that sort of thing and documents online. Um, but once again, for the older conferences, actually PepsiCo was very generous in uh, taking and scanning all of these uh, older proceedings and so on and so forth. And actually, Brian, you should be particularly happy because they scanned my copy of the one from the conference in 1996, and that included the Barley community. So it was <laughs> big. very, very big <laughs> books and proceedings. So those are all there. Um, so if I scroll back to the top, I guess at this point, because we are still waiting for Pamela, um, I will show you the website. So there's a link here for the, the current IOC website. If I click there, why is that not working? There we go. So this is the website for the 11th, what will be the 11th International Oak Conference in October uh, this fall in Perth. Uh, registration is open for the conference and also abstracts are due for the end of March. So if anyone is planning on giving some sort of presentation, please get your abstracts and so on ready for that. And they do have a, a sort of a mailing list where you can stay updated as well. And of course, information um, the various people running it. So I think that's pretty much all that I had to share with you. I will put the links, those links into the chat. I'll stop sharing now. And Jim, any luck? She's trying to get in. <laughs> okay, hey, this is great. <laughs> and uh, so I know she's actively trying and I'm not sure if um, it's going to work or not. So I'm watching um, both our, our uh, attendees and we can promote her to panelists so she uh, makes it in. Um, or I'm looking for an email confirming that we'll have to reschedule this. Again, very sorry to, to everyone there. It is um, a user error from, from uh, my end and my end alone. So. <laughs> I can, I can take a crack at giving it as a start before we Pamela comes on. She may repeat some of what I say, but want to do that? That's okay. fine with me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Okay. Well, uh, I think the key things are, are when, when the whole operation started and so on. And of course, for those of you who are, most of you who are probably uh, uh, listening today, uh, we've had the American Oak Workers Conference or something with a different name and so on for quite a number of years. Uh, and uh, out of that, I think largely because there were back in the in the 60s uh, and, and even, you know, even later than that, but particularly in the 60s and 70s, an awful lot of us who worked on oat uh, in North America, particularly, worked on other crops. Well, myself on barley, uh, Fred Kolb and others on wheat as well, especially a number of the people in the eastern U.S. 
and Eastern Canada were, were researchers working on both crop kinds or two crop kinds, at least two, if not more. And all of us had had opportunities to attend international wheat conferences and probably particularly the International Barley Genetics Symposium, as it was called back then. And people recognize the tremendous value in getting together as international groups. And you have to remember, the only way to communicate in those days was either by telephone or on, in handwritten mail. So, you know, sharing things was difficult, if you will, compared to what it is today. Now, for those of you who share in today's systems, you don't know how difficult it was. But, you know, it used to take at least a week or 10 days for me to correspond with, uh, you know, say something like Vern Burroughs in Ottawa from Saskatoon when I, when I started back in the late 1970s. Uh, so, you know, sharing information, uh, what meetings were really the way it was done. And about that time as well, international travel became a lot more routine and a lot easier for people and also somewhat more affordable. Uh, you know, prior to that time, it was really expensive to, you know, head off to a meeting somewhere in Europe or, or you know, around to the bottom of the world in Australia or New Zealand, something like that. But gradually that changed and that really helped us all out. And so the group in uh, back in, uh, in, in, they met in Iowa in 1981. And at that point, there was a lot of discussion. There were a couple of folks from Europe that were at that meeting, which was really quite unusual. That was a meeting of the American Oak Workers. And at that meeting, there was actually a separate session. If you look back in the minutes, you can see they had a little separate session in the business meeting. Everything was fairly formal back then. Uh, and they discussed the uh, beginning of an old conference and Ken Fry in particular, I think, as I recall it, I mean, I wasn't at those meetings because I was working on oats then, but I didn't have the money to travel to meetings even in the US. <laughs> so uh, I think Ken Fry was one of the, the key people along with folks like Dion Stuthman and Hazel Shands and others who said, we need to do this for oats as well. So they got, got their, their act together and they formed a small committee and that committee worked toward putting together the first international oat conference, which was in Penn State in 1982. And again, if you look in the newsletters, you can find, you know, uh, even then those, those groups were formed well enough uh, with enough structure and so on that they had um, minutes and, and, you know, made decisions about where to go from there and so on. And then, and then the next meeting and one that I had wanted to attend, but I had to make a choice based on my budget between going to the first International Barley Genetic Symposium I could attend or the Oat Conference in Wales. So I unfortunately wasn't able to be at that one. Um, uh, and then we had the meeting, uh, my first direct involvement personally was at the meeting in Sweden. And uh, we, uh, uh, we met there and, uh, and that, was, uh, that was in 1988 uh, and uh, it was, was a good meeting. And we were gradually beginning to, um, one of the differences that some of us, particularly those of us who attended the barley meetings noted about the oat meeting was that it was, it was almost too formal. It was very much like a scientific conference and, and it was very staid and so on. And at five o'clock, the carpets would roll up and everybody show up the next morning. And that certainly didn't happen at barley meetings. Uh, <laughs> there, was, there was always some social activity in the evening. <laughs> and so one of the things that we gradually worked in and Andy Barr with his, when he hosted the meeting in Australia in 1992, um, uh, in typical Aussie style, uh, made sure we had lots of social activities along with the, uh, uh, along with the more formal parts of the meeting. Not that the meetings before that were dull or anything like that, but you know, there was that need to interact with people and so on. And, uh, uh, and so we had more uh, uh, social activities, but they were always, you know, social activities, a bunch of bunks of international oat research is always gonna be about talking about oats, but maybe having a beer in your hand when you were doing it. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that that really made quite a difference. Uh, when we hosted in 1996 in Saskatoon, uh, Brian Harvey uh, was the malting barley breeder at the time, and I was the, uh, the, the other barley breeder and the oat breeder at Saskatoon, and we proposed to the two committees uh, that we should give a shot at hosting them together. And if you actually look back at the meeting minutes of the 1981 meeting back in I at Iowa, um, there was a fair bit of discussion about trying to combine the original oat conference with barley uh, or wheat. And again, that was because there were so many people who worked on both crops and it would be somewhat efficient in terms of traveling and costs and that kind of thing. But it never came to pass, but just happened that the barley meetings were every five years and the oak meetings were every four years and it happened to fall together in 1996. So Brian and I made the, the presentation. I didn't have too much trouble convincing the oak group that this would be a good idea. 
But uh, Brian did have some difficulty in convincing the Barley Group. They were a bit more standoffish, if you will. And, uh, and by putting the two meetings together, we were able to attract, uh, I think, uh, a lot of uh, 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 really top-notch invited speakers in particular. And there was a lot of synergy between the two groups that formed. Unfortunately, from my point of view, uh, that the, the committees decided, uh, particularly the Barley Committee, uh, decided not to follow up on that uh, joint meetings. Uh, having said that, by that point, the old group had become uh, solidified enough and large enough to really function quite well on its own. Uh, one of the big features of those meetings, of course, was sponsorship. And the early meetings had very little, if any, sponsorship. I'm sure Quaker uh, Oates was putting something in, you know, to buy lunch or something like that at all the meetings and so on. But it was, it was basically a fairly narrow group, mostly genetics and pathology. And we opened it up. Andy started in Australia. And we, we did a lot more to open it up to more on agronomy, actual producers involved, and, and putting a much bigger effort into things like lab and field tours. So people could not only exchange scientific information, but the technological sorts of things. I mean, one of the greatest things I learned from all these international conferences I went to was about somebody's new piece of equipment that would make life easier for my technical crew in the field or make life better for the technical crew in the quality lab. Those kind of things, that, that's what's so important about these meetings. And interacting, at that point in time, we started to have more direct involvement from end users. And that gave everyone the opportunity, particularly the breeders, but also pathologists and agronomists and, and, and others, quality scientists and so on, but more opportunity to really interact with the end user community to bring together the whole group and, and talk about future plans, future needs, future possibilities, things that had been done, things that were you know, hot off the, uh, off the trot at the time of the meeting, uh, but also to carry on with, with things into the future and led to fa a fair, I think a fairly significant number of international collaborations. Uh, I mean, particularly for those of us across North America, but also involving folks from uh, the UK and from Europe, Sweden in particular, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand and so on. And at that time, a number of us in the Northern Hemisphere were starting to use New Zealand as our winter increase for the plant breeding portions of our programs. And so there was this ongoing connection even between meetings. But I think the key was that those meetings allowed people to see, meet each other, know each other. And in particular, for someone like me as a breeder, I was able to see my material growing in another environment, sometimes a totally inappropriate environment where it looked like crap, <laughs> and other times where geez, it didn't look too bad at all. And what that gave me as a breeder then was insight into which breeding programs around the world were probably best for me to collaborate with, exchange germplasm with, and help both of our programs. And uh, uh, to me, that was one of the greatest advances uh, that we were able to make uh, was finding out that, you know, we could use germplasm from anywhere for a specific disease resistance gene that somebody might have that we could use or so on. But more importantly was to find those areas of the, of the rest of the world that were very compatible with the, with the um, Western Prairie, Canadian Western Prairie area of adaptation and find new germplasm to pop into my program. And this was before we had all the nice genetic markers and so on that people have now. This is where the sort of a lot more of the art of plant breeding uh, came in and uh, it really, really helped our program tremendously, not to mention the great friendships we made all around the world and so on. And, and as an example, you know, Andy Barr and I communicate almost weekly still, even though Andy's now farming and I'm now retired. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that started off uh, by a chance ending up sitting beside each other on a bus, on a tour, and I can't remember if it was at the 88 um, meeting in Sweden for oats or if it was one previous one in Barley in Scotland. I can't remember where we met, but uh, you know that started off a long time friendship as well as tremendous amount of collaboration on the work front. Um, how are we doing with Pamela? <laughs> no luck yet, Jim? Uh, I, Pamela's not going to make it, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I guess then I, I, I just carry on. Uh, do, you wanna, do you want me to stop and we'll reschedule? Uh, actually, we have a special request that just came through for you to comment um, on the heat and dust at the Kernan farm <laughs> uh, during the 96 uh, meeting in Saskatoon. 
Well, you, the people who remember that uh, would like to know that those beautiful plots we had that year, which were some of the, which fortunately for us, for both commodities, was some of the best plots we'd ever had at that time of year. Um, all the oat plots that year got snowed on before they got harvested. <laughs> And I'm sure that uh, had uh, Aaron Beatty tried to host the meeting this year, the field day would have been canceled because the drought was so bad. There just wasn't any plots there at all. <laughs> so I, I, I guess if you want me to carry on, Jim, I can. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm certainly enjoying this. Um, and, and I think there are a couple other folks that we might um, pull up to be panelists too. Sure. Have some insights to share as well. I guess one of the other things I, I, I'd say was that uh, I'd learned from uh, my involvement, although I was never uh, officially the barley representative for Canada on the International Barley Genetics Symposium, uh, but that group had a very, um, uh, a very different approach to funding the conferences and so on. And they actually created a, a budget so that the people who were on the committee got paid to go to the meetings and paid to go in between meetings and look at sites and see if they were appropriate and so on. And the old committee, we just didn't go there. Uh, was, uh, but still budget is a really important part of doing one of these conferences. They're very expensive to put on and you're quite a risk as the host in the case because there's no backup <laughs> for, the, uh, for the Oat Conference. But what we did was, um, I, th I think Andy was probably the first one who had a, a small surplus at the end of his meeting. And what he did was he transferred that to me uh, so that I could use it as startup funding for the oat portion. And the barley community had a much larger pot for us to work with as well at Saskatoon. Uh, but we did that and, and, and our meeting at Saskatoon was very large because of the two commodities and, uh, and the timing was good and so on. And we did, we did quite well. And we had quite a little bit of uh, uh, money left over at the end of the meeting. And we just divided it as appropriate between the two groups and the Barley community, got, the Barley Genetic Symposium got their money to go into their sort of official accounts and so on. And I just held the money uh, in Saskatoon until um, Keith needed it for the conference in New Zealand. And as he needed some funds to get started on organizing things over the four year period and so on, he, um, he took that on and, uh, and, uh, and kept it going. And that moved along that way uh, transferred to the folks in Finland, and then there was some money left over from that conference, which was held and transferred to Dion stuff and the meeting in Minnesota and so on. Things changed when the meeting went to China. That was my, uh, the Minnesota meeting was the last one I was able to attend, actually. But uh, things, it just didn't work to transfer funds to China, and that's not how the Chinese group operated and so on. So I'm not sure Pamela would know, but I'm not sure if that's still carrying on now uh, from the last two meetings or if uh, uh, if Pamela and company are having to start from scratch again. But I think it was, it was also a very useful thing because it allowed some other people who might not have been able to um, uh, host the conference. I know the New Zealand one probably wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been invited to New Zealand if Keith hadn't known that he was going to have some, some money there to, you know, to sort of hold the bag if things went really bad. Uh, because you do have a lot of expenses uh, with these things, uh, particularly once we uh, had the meetings with a bit more social activity and so on. Um, just uh, from my own personal point of view, I became directly involved with the IOC uh, as the, uh, as the uh, organizing committee chair from 1992 to 1996. And then uh, uh, I ended up chairing the IOC for the, the normal procedure was the host uh, was the organizing committee chair, obviously. And then the host of that meeting became the chair of the IOC committee while the next person took over as the uh, organizing committee chair. Uh, and, uh, and so I was, uh, I was in the normal position, I was chair of the committee from 96 to 2000. Unfortunately, Keith's employment situation and what have you changed shortly after uh, 2000, and he was no longer able to sort of take, you know, keep the role as chair of the IOC. So I ended up being chair of the IOC for eight years <laughs> and then past chair for four years. So I was, really heavily involved with the IOC proper, if you will, for a long period of time during my career. And it was extremely rewarding to do that, sometimes a little bit frustrating, uh, but uh, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an excellent experience for me as a professional myself. And that was a big part of the activity as well. So, you know, those are some of the little details that I think, you know, people who just attended conferences, uh, you know, all they know about was whether we had bad food one night or whether it was dirty and dusty in the field or the bus was rough or whatever it might be. 
uh, but I really think the social aspects of these meetings, along with the really high quality science that's there, uh, are, are, are really a key to the whole operation. And I'm really glad to see that it's continuing. And I hope COVID doesn't wreck it again <laughs> for 2022. I see Nick's there. He's got something to say. <laughs> I'm not sure I have something to say, but I was told to say something. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I, I really hope we do reschedule this because I would like to hear what Pamela has to say. I know she's put a lot of effort into preparing something. and uh, She, she so has for, already offered to do so. so we yeah, will, so that, we will that's reschedule. great. So, so for those of us, for anyone that's still sticking around, I guess I can riff along with Brian for a little bit. Um, as I said, I don't have anything prepared, but... Uh, um, I, I jotted down a couple of things I might comment on. I guess, first of all, um, I am the current chair uh, of the International Oat Conference. Uh, we started trying to call it the Informa International Oat Committee, um, but the, the word conference used to get used synonymously with committee. And so it became very confusing whether um, the committee, which is composed of, uh, actually, this is, this is quite important. This is probably more of the formal stuff that Pamela would have presented, but there is a, a, an international committee that's composed of one representative from every country that attends the conferences. Every country that that's really wants to engage can, can nominate a, a representative. So that's the official International Oat Conference Committee or International Oat Committee, if you prefer. Um, the executive uh, is the um, is basically the chair, and this year we have, or this last four years, we have two chairs: myself and uh, Catherine Howarth at Aberystwyth. Um, I think that's worked really well because it's uh, you know one of us can and chime in, and, and uh, we can share the workload. And if one of us decides to retire before that date, then you know <laughs> things hanging. Um, <clears throat> No comment. I, I, I think we'll both be there this year. Um, we also have a secretary. Um, I guess that's sort of a dated word, but uh, uh, Kathy Kloss is the, the uh, I don't know whether we can call her administrative assistant or what, but we, we kind of copy each other on, on all of our official business. And um, she's kind of there as a, as a backup and as a, as a third voice in, in all of this. And that's really the executive. Uh, although if you look at the, uh, it, the American Oat Workers Organization, it's a lot more structured. Um, and that's, that's one of the things I wanted to comment on is that the, oat, the American Oat Workers has been around a lot longer. It's been engaged with the, the government, uh, in, uh, particularly in the US federal government. That'll stop in a second. Um, and, 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 and so we've had um, appointees from the US and Canada government on that committee. It's a much more structured committee and it's a much older committee. The International Oak Conference grew a lot more organically, as Brian told you. Um, we have, uh, it's, it's probably a more informal conference, but we do have a business meeting. And I think one of the things I'm trying to do as, as, as chair uh, over the last four years is find that right level of uh, formality uh, and cash, casualness, um, because times are changing these days, um, which is another thing I'll comment on. One of the formal things that we've done, and, and we've been helped by the newsletter in that, is, is to publish more of the, the structure of the committee, who's on the committee, so we can find that out, um, <clears throat> and publish the minutes that we talk about at the business meeting. Uh, I think th those were always published um, as part of the American Hope Workers newsletter. <laughs> My phone might not stop ringing, but there it goes. <laughs> um, quite distracting. Anyway, we've been, uh, uh, we haven't had uh, proceedings uh, other than the conference proceedings that, um, that come out. So now that we have the old newsletter, we, we have those proceedings in a more recorded fashion uh, than just leaving them um, stray on all the different uh, um, sites that they used to be on. So we're trying to formalize that a little bit more, formalize the committee, um, formalize the, uh, the governments. And one of the big things we did together with the American Oat Workers Conference was to transfer the nomenclature committee over to the International Oat Conference. And that, you know, to formally do that and make sure it was recorded and make sure everyone was okay with that, we first had to vote, vote to transfer it from the American Oat Workers. And, and I did that when I was part of, what, when I was chair of the American Oat Workers. And then we had to accept it by the International Oat Conference and then we went through, particularly uh, in response to what's happening now in the, in the pan-genome uh, world and, and the discovery of what 
what the elk chromosomes actually are and actually made of and, and uh, um, complete maps. Um, we wanted to make sure there was a, a representative committee of experts to, to put names on things and to validate that because there's been some confusion lately on which show chromosomes are which uh, and other things. So we, we have a, a formal International Oat Nomenclature Committee now that's part of the International Oat Conference and we'll, uh, we'll renew that at the conference in Australia. And that again can be found in the uh, Oat newsletter. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, formality, uh, informalness, uh, I think they're both important. Um, along those lines, I wanted to come pick up on something Brian said about risk. And that is something I really first experienced when, uh, when we chaired in Ottawa, the, uh, American Oat Workers Conference, uh, and when was that? 2014? Uh, <clears throat> and... You know, we weren't really supposed to, as federal workers, be handling money. Um, and I had to get special dispensation to open up a bank account and handle money for that conference. Um, and I, I'm sure if we asked, there's a lot more rules that we broke uh, in hosting that conference, but we just plugged through and did it. Um, and that's uh, getting more and more difficult, perhaps even at universities, to do something like that, um, unless your university has a special conference branch. So we don't, we want to keep having these conferences. We want to keep them um, accessible. We want to keep them affordable. I think the Australian group is doing an excellent job with a lot of support from industry there. In, um, but, but in that case, I think industry's taken a, a large part of the risk of hosting that conference, which this, during the pandemic has turned out to be real risk. Um, but that risk is always there and having uh, money that can be carried over might be something that continues to be important. I'm, I'm, but you know, unless you've got somebody like Brian um, that's willing to to take a risk and break a few rules to do that, um, I'm not sure if we've got. It. Well, actually, the uh, uh, Oat. Uh, sorry, we're we're being hosted here by Oat Global, and and maybe there's a mechanism um, to to help um, carry money forward, that sort of thing. So I, I, that's just something that floated to my head right now. Um, participation's uh, been important. Uh, um, it's, it's really great to start to see people come out from small countries that you didn't even know grew oats. Uh, um, that's one of the beautiful things about going to these conferences. Um, I was going to say my first conference was the uh, Saskatoon meeting. So uh, that, uh, uh, that was when, when I first felt welcomed into the fold, and I, I really did feel welcomed into the fold, and I, Charlene, I think, is saying that that was her first meeting, too. Uh, um, and uh, so, you know, if, if there's something to be said, uh, and I hope we don't lose that about getting together with people for, for a beer or for a party, and uh, we've had some great ones, and uh, um, feeling comfortable with picking up the phone or picking up a video conference now and, and asking your colleagues a question. Uh, no, maybe Charlene wants to riff a bit more about this. I, I don't have any other notes here. Actually, there, there was one other thing I thought that maybe should be mentioned. And actually, Brian, or yeah, you can speak to this as well, because a little while ago, a number of us, you know, we've been discussing this Oat Workers Code of Ethics. And that was something that was formalized, I think, last in 2000. Uh, I could call it up. I yeah, I think at Minnesota. Um, well, in any case, it, things, a lot of things have changed uh, with international law and all that sort of thing since that code of ethics was established, because that was meant to be within the group, right? Sort of sharing germplasm and so on. And, and it could apply to data as well, I suppose. Um, but yeah, we need, these days we have to be a lot more careful because there is now the International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture <laughs> that's uh, binding uh, law. And of course, it depends too on which country you're in, how that law is applied and all this kind of thing. And that particular treaty, which is just tends to be called the Plant Treaty, actually Axel, and Axel spoke about that uh, last fall actually. So that was one reason why we had him make that presentation was so people were aware of the, the provisions of the treaty. Um, and that applies to oats as a crop. But then of course, there's also another added layer. Uh, there's the Convention of Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol 
there are ties there when you start looking at some of the wild species and this type of thing. And now we're also getting into a huge sort of mess with uh, digital sequence information. So all these genomes and sequences and markers and so on and so forth. And actually maybe Brian, you could um, speak about how that was developed a little bit. And, and then, but that is something that's gonna have to be addressed I think by uh, international Oak conference committees. Yeah, well, I would I would say that uh, uh, you know it it really started uh, in my experience at the American Oak Workers Conference, and it was all about um, as we began to get into issues with some institutions, some fed, you know, some governments, some uh, universities, and so on in the '70s and well, more in the '80s, I guess it was, uh, with regard to intellectual property and all that kind of stuff, and uh, so. You know, there'd been a, an informal arrangement amongst almost all the, bar, uh, the plant breeding community, really, in, uh, on cereals, at least in, in North America, uh, that, you know, if, if, if someone sent you some material and you looked at it in the field and you wanted to make a cross with it, you just went ahead and made a cross with it. And, uh, you know, technically now you shouldn't be doing that without their permission. And even between government agencies within government agencies there were issues that, that arose and so on so the oat workers group uh, uh you know we we uh, and the barley group was doing it at the same time uh in north america we you know we sat down and we had at one of the meetings i don't remember which one it was but we drew up uh, some uh criteria and uh, that everybody agreed to and and you know the deal was that if you were part of this group then that said you agreed to this germplasm sharing agreement as it was or whatever it might be. And uh, Charlene's quite right. That's become extremely complicated, relatively speaking, now. Uh, I'm not sure how you would really handle it all because it's different in different situations, whether it's germplasm or information, uh, that sort of thing. But at least at the germplasm level, you know, exchanges between, let's say, breeders or breeding programs. I think it's reasonably, I mean, I really shouldn't say having not exchanged any germplasm for about 10 years now, uh, I think it's reasonably still handled well. Um, I know that we used to joke, uh, I worked an awful lot with, on barley with the breeding program with Ag Canada and Brandon, and Mary Oterian and Bill Lake and I and Brian Harvey used to joke that somewhere in the file cabinet in everybody's office were some letters that said we agreed to do this, but we had no idea what the bloody things were, and we just kept exchanging germplasm. Uh, <laughs> And nobody knew that what, nobody else, nobody further up the system in either organization was any the wiser. Uh, but these days, uh, I think individuals need to be more careful about that than we were, uh, because uh, you know there can be uh, legal issues around these things. Uh, Nick, you just reminded me in, in your comments. I changed the subject a little bit, but one of the other key things that I forgot to mention as a responsibility of the committee, uh, and largely it was the the organizer of the current meeting that was that just you know, not formally but informally took the responsibility to try to identify the organizer for the next committee or the next meeting uh, and that was always a big problem and we did run into a couple of issues uh, over the years where someone said they were going to host the meeting and then we would find out two years into the four-year gap they hadn't done a damn thing <laughs> and then somebody had to pick up the ball late in the game and usually that was someone who had already done it. Uh, this occurred once in the barley community, for sure, that I'm aware of, where, you know, somebody, oh, yeah, they were you know, all gung-ho and they were going to host the next meeting uh, at the time of the current meeting. And then two years later, nothing was happening. And, and we had to uh, sort of rush in. And, and in fact, I think maybe, uh, uh, in fact, maybe Dion got hooked on that with the Minnesota meeting in 2008. It wasn't until about 2006 that we officially... Uh, changed from wherever it was we're going and I won't mention where that was supposed to be uh, because the people didn't follow through and Dion you know picked it up with only two years to organize and if you haven't done one of these things you need to be on to the organization of that next meeting the day you get home from the previous one <laughs> uh, particularly in terms of venues and um, you know sponsorship and all those kind of things you need to really keep that rolling along in between and that really you know in the case of the of the oat group um, th that was really done on a, you know, in my experience, it was individuals who took it on themselves to get that done. And, you know, I think we need, you know, the group needs to give uh, 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 Nick and his, and his small committee a lot of thanks for, at the current time, keeping this whole thing rolling. 
because it can fall apart really easily if you just get some people who just say, oh, the hell, I'm not doing it, or they change jobs, you know, all the kinds of things that happen, especially these days. And, uh, and it, 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 it's hard to keep it going. And uh, just with regard to that, it's a bit of a technical detail, but I do know that there were funds left over from the, uh, the meeting in Minnesota. And uh, uh, we, you know, after Dion passed away, Howard and I went back and forth a number of times at trying to decide what to do with that money because it was sitting at the U of M uh, in an account and Howard was getting bothered by the administrators there about this money there. And uh, I don't know if that ever did make it to the folks in St. Petersburg to help them out or, or what happened. It, um, I see a uh, thumbs up from uh, Australia. Um, oh, oh, it did get I, I think it skipped over both uh, China and uh, Russia for, for technical right. reasons there. Um, As I said, normally it would have gone to the folks in China, but they didn't. They, they couldn't take it. Was basically what it boiled down to. Uh, and uh, so I'm glad to hear that it's it's still uh, finding its way somewhere. I don't think it's a whole pile of money, but it's it's it it it's, that serves two purposes. One is it's useful to keep things get things started for the new organizers, and the other it keeps some of this continuity that Nick was talking about. And I yeah. talked about that really important. And and the same thing uh, works in the American Oat Workers right. and, and really saves the day um, because uh, of unexpected uh, um, consequences or unexpected expenses that happened at the Seattle meeting. And, and so it basically carried on until that. Um, I was going to pick up on something else you said about keeping the, uh, the meeting going. Uh, and we do have a, you, you don't just pre start preparing when you come home from the conference. Uh, <laughs> We, we want to know who's going to host the next conference in Australia, in Perth. Um, and so the call has gone out to all of the uh, uh, representatives to put forward a, if they want, if their country wants to host a conference to prepare a bid for that. Uh, I don't know if there will be multiple bids, but if there are multiple bids, we will vote in Perth uh, for, for the winning bid. Um, so we, we've structured that call uh, this year and it's gone out. And if, uh, if you want to host a conference and you haven't got that call, find, go to the newsletter, find out who your rep is <laughs> and bug them uh, because that should have been circulated. Um, and, and this is another thing I'll say about the representatives. Um, we, we call on those representatives to communicate with people in their country. And, and, and oftentimes when when we, well, we, we vote those representatives in at every conference. And, and sometimes it's, it's not so much voting, it's, it, it's just, uh, does this person want to, who's been doing a good job want to continue? Um, this person didn't show up, is there somebody new? And, and the people from that country who are at the conference are expected to, to nominate. And I've never been in a situation where there's a, a power struggle uh, or the need for a vote. It's, it's often quite obvious, but those people are, brought forward by the country to represent the country. And, um, and, and it usually works quite well. And, and we, uh, as the executive, we, we put um, questions out such as the, the voting and, and uh, questions about the structure of the International Nomenclature Committee. So um, it's something that we hope to rely on more. And I've talked to uh, Oat Global about this as Oat Global has been coming together and gone through a couple of iterations. Um, to, to point out that this really is uh, an international group of people that can probably do more representation uh, in the future than, than they've been doing. Um, <clears throat> I was going to comment too on, on your, your, your topic of risk there and, and uh, on the topic of the, uh, the germplasm issue and, uh, and it's things, things are getting more and more difficult to comply to. Um, and, and, you know, one, one of the themes of the International Oak Conference is, is, I guess, we try to break, break as many barriers down without getting in trouble as, as possible. Um, so that, that gets harder and harder, um, and, and, and people have to navigate that uh, their own ways. But we're not, we're not trying to break rules, we're trying to break barriers. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good theme. Um, because in, in this world, I think, there's a lot of opportunities now for big ideas, uh, things like artificial intelligence, uh, the pan genome and molecular biology, all of these things are coming down the road. They have the opportunity to change a lot of things. Um, and I'm actually reading a book about this and the, the book um, tries to convince us that big, we're running out of big ideas, that the actual flow of big ideas is, is decreasing. And the reasons for that are, are compliance, risk aversion, um, something called the burden of knowledge. It's harder and harder to get to the point where you can make an innovation. Um, and, and then the obvious one that all the low hanging fruit have been 
plucked already. So we've got to take these advantages um, and, uh, and use them um, to, to continue having big ideas because we're going to need those. And, uh, and the International Oak Conference is, is the place to discuss those ideas and make them happen in the world of oak. Right, and actually there's, Bruce has actually put a comment in the quote, in the chat here, Bruce Roskins, uh, would also highly recommend the committee immediately start looking for sponsorship because yeah, the yeah. location for the next meeting may very well be dependent on uh, on sponsorship funding. Yes, that's, that's one of the criteria that uh, that is in the call for yeah. uh, venues. And, and we do have uh, Ash Wees here with us, who's from the organizing committee for the Perth meeting. So maybe, uh, you know, the next uh, little bit to end things off, uh, Ash can talk to us about just exactly what's going to be going on. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. That's great. Um, this is my first joining one of these calls, and I've really, really enjoyed it. So thanks for the opportunity. And nice to see you again. Um, I, um, yeah, so like um, when Western Australia uh, won the right to host the meeting, we, we're a small organisation um, called Grains Industry of Western Australia, which is a not-for-profit uh, industry organisation, which represents the whole industry, um, right from sort of breeders, growers, um, supply chain, you know, um, um, all, all the way through. So it's a really diverse organisation. Um, so we're, we're sort of excited about host, hosting this. It's been painful um, putting it off over these last few years and keep keep delaying it, um, but absolutely on track. Um, got a great um, committee of people putting putting the program together. Um, so really excited about what's going to happen. I, I've really enjoyed, especially Brian's insight um, into this. I have attended an international, sorry, an Oak Workers Conference in Seattle um, a few years ago. So. That was that was a great insight as well, but it's it's just I you know it, when we're putting this program together, um, it, it, like hearing what Brian wants out of out of a conference like this, including the social aspect, the interaction with other areas of the industry, and I think we're going to do that really well in you know Australians do social social interaction well, which is good, <laughs> but. But you know, we 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 are trying to also attract um, some local um, interaction um, to a to a grower level, agronomy level in this program as well. And we and that that was some of the questions we we're having when we we're putting this together. Is um, you know, from an economic point of view, we want to get a lot of attendees. Um, so there's a part a part of this program around that agronomy as well. Um, so it's great to hear your your aspect, that, you know, you, you going to a trial site and seeing some machinery or whatever, you know, or, or, or talking to farmers of what they do, um, that interaction is important. So that's that's really nice to hear that endorsement. Um, um, we're also going to be engaging with end users, you know, and, and part of the theme is around, you know, the health trends in oaks and, and what end users want as well, as well which I think will be good. Um, really hoping this is face-to-face. -face. Um, so um, it'll be, you know, We've got to deal with whatever the world throws at us, but you know we've we've kind of turned our attention back to face to face and really want to have that social interaction and make sure there's lots of networking opportunities and and all that, which will be good. Which will be good. Um, that startup uh, funding um, it was a small parcel, but that has been really important. It's it's allowed us to set up a website, do some branding, um, and I'd really encourage you to visit that website. Like the draft program is up on there, and um, you can you know you can see all the background behind that. Um, um, yeah, so we, we've had a great panel and, you know, um, I think Charlene, you've had something to do with Rachel from our team and she's um, awesome and, and um, you know, we've had a lot of great interaction with um, people people coming along and putting together the program. So that's been good. Um, our sponsorship has been amazing. So we've had just really good response for going out and asking for sponsorship, which which gives us a little bit of confidence um, that you know we, we will have some money to hand on after this event um, that we can pull it through and in, and make it a black budget you know as well. So um, that's great because it is when you when you're trying to put something together and you're not sure if it's going to be virtual attendees or face to face, um, it, it, there's a, there is a bit of financial risk, um, and we are a, a small not for profit. Um, that doesn't really want to take a lot of that risk, but um, <laughs> but we'll, you know we've had we've had just really good engagement with the industry here and and really good support and, and really good support from our local government as well. So um, so that's that's been great. Um, I think that's most of what I want to say. Um, 
Yeah, but just have confidence that we are on track and we got a great team that are, that are used to putting together events like this and doing it extremely well. So just really, really want to make sure that people try to get here in person um, would be fantastic um, because it will be a great social um, and opportunity to engage with the whole industry. Um, yeah, so looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. Yes, I'm very much looking forward to being able to go. I hope that works out. Of course, part of that's up to Nick because he's also my boss. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, you have many more bosses than me. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it comes to money. <laughs> oh, yes, very, very true. Yes, this and is very, very true. Right, yeah. But actually, just as we're winding up here a bit, um, I was just remembering that actually, you know, at the beginning of Pamela's presentation, she had this wonderful slide wishing everybody a happy Australia Day. <laughs> so <laughs> for those of you who are, you know, Australian, happy Australia Day. And we also realize that actually, I guess for you, for you, Ash, and, and maybe Rachel as well, because uh, uh, Rachel is on the call. Um, it's very, very early in the morning, even though we tried to time this so that it, it wasn't too bad. It was eight o'clock in the morning for Pamela and for, for you guys. It, it's 6.30 now, I guess, almost, right? You, we started at 5.30 your time in the morning. So, um, yeah, <laughs> thanks so much for, uh, um, you know, coming along that, that early and starting your day with us. Kind it's of. too hot to sleep in Perth today anyway, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been bizarre. We have, we've had, over the last few weeks, we've had 40 degree days um, yeah. more, more often than not. It's been, been crazy. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. It, it's uh, been more like minus 30 here. So <laughs> it's just a little, a little bit different. But it balances out. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, somewhere, yes. So... Jim, is there, uh, I mean, we'll, we will have to reschedule Pamela's actual presentation. Yes, yes. yeah, and I, I want to thank everyone for their patience and certainly um, our esteemed panelists for <laughs> um, sharing their insights. Uh, it really has been a, a fun conversation for me and I hope it has been for you too. And we will get, we will get um, uh, Pamela back another time. And we'll also have to sort out, uh, so right now in February, um, the person who's supposed to speak is Alan Raddy, who's also from Australia, uh, in Western Australia. So the time and day, it, it, I'd like to make sure that's confirmed, Jim. I don't think we finalized that, but um, it will be a similar time to this, maybe an hour later. I think he was thinking that, you know, starting at 6.30 for him instead of 5.30 was, was a little bit better. But, um, but yeah, so there's going to be more information uh, coming up about that later on as well. So um, yeah, and uh, I see Rachel in the chat has just uh, thanked everyone and is, is also looking forward to welcoming everybody to Australia. And uh, yeah, oh, Alan's on the call too. I'm sorry, Alan, I didn't realize you were there. <laughs> That's terrible. Anyway, yes, we're very much looking forward to hearing you speak as well. So we'll have to sort out how that's going to work. So uh, anything else anyone would like to add? Uh, there's a question actually in the Q&A. Would you? Oh. OK. Did you want to read it or do you want me to read it? Um, uh, sure. So this is um, for Brian. Uh, you mentioned that exchange of oat genotypes for breeding programs. Uh, is it internationally happening or within a few countries that have some uh, sort of MTA? Uh, I really can't answer that. Back in my time, I retired 10 years ago. So uh, back in my time, it was happening all the time. I was uh, one of the people known to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency import people very well because I was a real nuisance because I probably imported more germplasm of both oats and barley from <laughs> God knows everywhere in the world with all kinds of phytosanitary dreamed up issues most of the time. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, uh, Nick, you may have a, a little better insight into that. I think Waikai is probably still bringing in germplasm from elsewhere to the Ottawa program. I hope he is. I hope he's able to. Uh, well, the international, uh, we had a talk uh, um, a while back from... Right. Um, uh, Steve Harrison on the international um, exchange of germplasm, which is, is another sort of challenges. But when it comes to the conferences, it's, it's really up to the 
country that's hosting the conference to communicate their requirements. And in the case of Australia, it was very special because they have to grow everything um, in advance in a greenhouse to make sure they're phytosanitary. Uh, so if you were going to send something to the Australia conference, you had to send it <laughs> in advance. And, and I, I suppose that might be something that we can do a better job of, of formally communicating uh, because that gets communicated after, once we know there's a host, that host will communicate what's needed. And, and it's, it's a combination of um, whether there's special requirements for the, the host country um, and, uh, and, and also what the, uh, you know, in the countries that's sending the material, how much support you get for producing whatever phytosanitary certificate that's needed. Uh, so it, it's I very ad hoc. Um, I took the question to be more about general germplasm exchange, Nick, rather than materials going to the conferences, because oh, that, okay. that is right. yeah. Australia. I mean, it's too late now if you haven't said, if you yeah. didn't send it last year for the folks to grow it out in the greenhouse, it ain't going to be in the field this summer. Or yeah. our summer they, they needed, they needed two years yeah. seed time yeah. to get yeah. enough seed. Actually, that was published in the newsletter. Yes, yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <clears throat> but, but just in terms of general germplasm exchange, as I said, I, I'm, I'm not doing that now, so I'm, I'm not sure, but I certainly hope it's going on. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure from talking with Aaron Beattie at the U of S, he's still routinely exchanging germplasm with whatever, you know, whoever breeder he has contacts with. And that's what the international conference is so valuable for, because you make that personal contact. Uh, and, you know, you can do that over a Zoom call now, I guess, but it's not, it's not the same as, as sitting at a dinner table or on a, on a bench in a field tour and, and talking with someone and, and finding out, gee, they've got some interesting material with some new rust resistance they think is good and so on and so forth. And, you, you know, you trade back and forth and hopefully, you know, all groups work out. Uh, I, just as a, an absolute example of that, I know myself, one of the first uh, international meetings I attended, uh, I met, I met uh, the breeder at the time who's now long since retired. Uh, and I have no more contact with him, but from Czechoslovakia. And, and I would have never thought, first of all, I didn't, I, you know, I knew that there was oats grown in that part of the Southern part of, uh, of, of Eastern Europe, but uh, he had an excellent program. And we, we just exchanged on the fact that we wanted to look at each other's stuff following the meeting. And it was some of the best and most interesting material that I'd ever gotten from anyone else to fit into the Western Canada uh, sort of situation. And a lot, if Aaron could go back and find a lot of old pedigrees with these weird Czechoslovakian <laughs> names <laughs> on, on parents. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, that exchange lasted for uh, until he retired and then they closed his program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but just one, one comment. Um, if you're going to Australia, you're imagining bringing oats in your pocket, I would not do that. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Because Australia and New Zealand have very strict. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, they, they, I, I went there with a tent and they took apart the tent to look for any little <laughs> particle of dirt that might be in there. So, so pocket breeding is not an option. Yeah. I've, had my, I've had my golf shoes washed for me in Sydney. <laughs> there you go. And actually, though, to, to that whole sort of issue, though, I think most people, I think, at this point are starting to become quite used to using <clears throat> excuse me, SMTA, so these standard material transfer yeah. agreements. And yeah. I know, for example, even though sometimes it's not necessary between certain countries, depending on the, the different laws, Axel, for example, at Plant Gene Resources of Canada, or Gene Bank, if somebody requests material, whatever, it, he makes everybody sign an SMTA regardless. And, and yeah. that's just a lot more straightforward, a lot simpler, just to kind of keep everybody everybody's treated the same way and uh, it falls within the law for the, the people where it's uh, essential. So, yeah. And actually there, there is another comment here from Alan. Oh, perhaps everyone has seen that because it's in the chat that Pamela has selected lines, um, international lines to grow and intergrain will cover the cost of demo plots at the conference. Mm, and on the site will look great on the field trip. So yeah, very much looking forward to being able to see that. So, is there any anything else? Would anyone else like to say something? We are a little bit past the, the half hour now, so we hope to see everyone again for 
panel's actual presentation. Listen, I hope to see everyone in Australia, and uh, um, you're welcome to uh, contact uh, me or Catherine as, as chairs of the committee. Um, but if it's a question specific to the local organizing committee, then you've, you're well represented with the, the group in Australia. Mm -hmm. And all their names and addresses are on that, uh, the international website page there, so IOC page. Yeah, great. Are we saying goodbye? Thank <laughs>